Today on Healing Words, we're going to talk about a different kind of storytelling, the kind that happens in music. Whether the story is told in lyrics or in the emotion of the notes being played, music can be transformative. It accompanies us during all of our big moments. It's in the background of nearly everything we do, from shopping to dating, graduating to getting married. It's part of our football games and our workouts. Our entire lives are set to a soundtrack. Music is powerful, and researchers have explored just how powerful it can be. Studies have shown that listening to music can reduce stress and anxiety, and even help people manage physical pain. It's helped to make new connections in the brains of patients with dementia and brain injuries. Today, we're going to learn what else music can do during our show. I'm excited to bring you a conversation with Dr. Lisa Wong, the author of Scales to Scalpels, Doctors Who Practice the Healing Arts of Music and Medicine. Dr. Wong is the former president of the Longwood Symphony, which is an orchestra in Boston made up of healthcare professionals. She's also a violinist in the violin section. Dr. Wong is an associate in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and maintains her own private practice. So thank you so much for being here today. This I'm is just delighted. a thrill. Thank you so much for having me. Well, so to begin, can you just tell us what is the Longwood Symphony? The Longwood Symphony is a now 30-year-old orchestra of medical professionals. Uh, we're about, there's about 80 of us, um, ranging from medical students to attendings to nurses, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and what brings us all together is healing the community through music. So you're a healer by day, you're a healer in the evenings when you're practicing and putting on concerts. And yep, that's actually what we found was when we first came together we just wanted to be an orchestra and we sensed that something was missing and when it was when we discovered that what we really needed to be doing is using our music to heal and to touch lives um, we played better and the, the orchestra found its its uh, point of re relevance isn't that interesting I, I, I find that so true of really creative expression of any kind mm -hmm. when there's a purpose behind it mm -hmm. and especially a healing purpose it just takes off, it really does. Um, and I think, I wanna read, this is a perfect segue to this quote that I have from your book, because you said, playing music is another way for us to heal. When you reach out your hand and try to touch the place between medicine and music, some place between the physical and the spiritual, you're coming close to one of the fundamental mysteries of life. It delves close to the core of what makes us human. I mean, I, I absolutely love that quote, number one. But two, I would love to hear what your experience has been of that place, you know, between medicine and music. What's your experience of that? Well, you can look at it from different um, points of view. Um, music is the first expression of, uh, uh, and means of communication. Um, babies respond to their mothers singing lullabies before they understand language. And babies themselves, the first thing they do is they start to coo. They don't have words, but they're, they're listening to the different kinds of sounds that they can make with their own voice. And um, moving forward, music becomes the universal language. Um, and the same piece that you play at a wedding can also be played at a funeral. Mm -hmm. And the poignancy, the joy, but the, the sadness that's inherent in many melodies uh, is, is, makes it so that you can use the music in, in, in different times. Yeah. So really, music expresses a lot of uh, humanity that we can't even verbalize. Yeah, I, well, and I have experienced that myself. We were talking before the show about um, the song Adagio for Strings, and just, it, you can almost feel the power of, the emotional power of the song, and it has this crescendo with this amazing moment at the top where every, the violins are in this really loud moment, but it really, it just, uh, every time I hear that song, I burst into tears. Yeah, it's, it, you know, we haven't figured out the pure neuroscience of all of this, and we never will, and I hope we, I kind of hope we don't. Mm -hmm. But the, the violin, the, the strings were um, invented, the instruments were invented to mimic the human voice. And so when they are all playing 
full out with passion and when you have this tension this harmonic tension that you want it to just become become a harmonic resolution but it's not there and there's that, that tension yeah. it it pulls at our heartstrings yeah it does doesn't it oh yeah and, and, and the other thing I love about it too is that that music is also accompanies joy and when you were talking about with children you know when we're teaching children and we sing and they're cooing and you had talked about how you sing to the children, the, the babies that come in. Uh, what do you sing to them? Well, it depends. Um, with infants, it, I use it a little bit diagnostically. I'll, I'll sing just little snippets of different nursery rhymes because when they're two or four months old, I want to know, can the baby look at me? Can they, can they hear me? Um, can they calm to, to hearing uh, soothing sounds? And so I just start singing to them and they, they quiet down to, and, and their eye contact tells me something. The fact that they heard me tells me something. And then also when they're quiet, I can hear their hearts uh, when I stop singing. And then um, when they're older and I'm giving them shots, I usually sing Old MacDonald Had a Farm. And what you do when in that situation, it's really engaging the patient as well. And so yeah. I say, okay, we have shots because I don't hide that from them. But what, what song, would, you know, we're gonna sing Old MacDonald Had a Farm, but what animal do you want to sing with? And so while the child is choosing the animal and thinking of what the animal's gonna say, we start with Old MacDonald Had a Farm and the shot is in before they ever get to the quack quack here or the moo moo there. And um, so we're far away from that. And, and sometimes with the older ones who've gone through this every year, I'll say, so you wanna be a rabbit? <laughs> <laughs> Since rabbits have no sound, <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. and so then they're laughing, and so they get the shot. So yeah, oh, that's so great. Yeah. Well, and I love that. That's a, a really beautiful application of music in a clinical setting. I mean, you're using that with patients and find it to be, I mean, almost, you know, it's actually working to distract. To I mean, it decreases pain. It distracts them because they're thinking beyond where the moment of of the shot is. And and yet, I'm being honest with them that it's a, a fact of life that they're going to ha have to get a shot because I never want to, mm -hmm. um, you know, to hide it from them or trick them. Yeah. Uh, because I'm going, I'm living a 20 year or 22 year uh, life with them. And so I, I don't want them to feel that they've been um, tricked that early or, you Yeah, know. that makes sense. Well, and I love that another thing that it appears to be doing is creating a connection between the two of you. You're sharing a song together. That's right. And you know, one of the other points in, in your book I really loved was that playing the playing of music helps develop empathy. So for the mm -hmm. medical staff and you know all of these folks that are in the the orchestra, that they talk about it helping to. Um, I love this. Uh, when you're playing in a chamber ensemble or treating a patient, there can be no success without a key ingredient: empathy. Our hearts reach out for the feelings of others, whether we are trying to harmonize with a fellow musician or trying to understand the source of a patient's pain. So how does it, how does it develop empathy? What's well, when we're playing an ensemble, we have to listen. We're, we're listening to each other very intently. And we have to be in sync with them in rhythm. We have to be in tune with them harmonically. And if they take a beat too fast or slow, you have a choice. You can say, no, I'm going to play it exactly this way, but mm. you'll, fall, you'll become farther and farther apart, or you'll make your, your adjustments so that you're back in, in sync together. And it's very much the same way with patient interaction. Uh, you can jump ahead and say, oh, you're going to say this. And the patient can say, no, actually, that's not my pain at all. And you know, and, but, and you'll have created a barrier, but also you're not understanding them as much. So the listening skills we have in playing ensemble, I do apply all the time to you know, quiet myself and and listen more deeply to what the patient's story is. Wow, the power of music. You know, because you don't think about that. I mean, so in your book, you really talk a lot about the playing of music and the benefits that that has. But what about listening to music? I mean, does that have similar benefits or what kind of benefits does, does just to, you know, being a consumer of music have? Well, now the neuroscience is really helping us out with this because, um, Listening to music engages a lot of a lot of our brain work, especially if a piece that we already know, for example, one of the pieces that you love, like the Barber Adagio, you start to anticipate what's coming next. Mm -hmm. It's like hearing a familiar fairy tale or a familiar story. And so you can't telegraph yourself to the end of the piece because you're gonna sit back and relax and listen to it as the story unfolds musically. Um, your rhythm section, which is your cerebellum, that's that's coming in time to the music. There's so much music that we hear and just automatically you look down and your foot is tapping 
or your fingers are snapping. Um, and the, the harmonies that you're, that you're hearing are also calming you. You start breathing in time to the music. Your heart starts to actually beat in time to the music. Wow. And so all of these things um, are happening with just listening to music. Um, the gift of being able to play music with, uh, with each other just adds on one more layer because then you're really engaging in communication and conversation as well. So, you know, there's many, many layers. And so, for example, if I have a, a kid who's starting to read early, a four-year-old or something, and you know they're going to get to kindergarten and they're going to start pushing the envelope a little bit because the teacher's trying to teach the letter A and the, 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 the child can already read, his, his parents will say, well, what can I do to challenge him? And I'll say, well, let him start the piano you can, because you, you can't ever win. There's always another piece, and you're not going to be held back by uh, just the language of, of the kindergarten curriculum. Um, so, and, and actually what happens sometimes is I encourage the kids always, like, what's your in instrument going to be? Because it's not going to always be, be the piano. Each instrument, um, it, each child hears a voice of an instrument and knows that, that, that that's their voice. Um, so some are clarinetists, some are trombonists. In fact, I, last week I just saw a pair of nine-year-old twins who'd both chosen the trombone. Um, but I encourage them to come back, the, you know, for their physicals and bring their instruments and play for me when they come for their exams. Oh, for that's their exams. great. I love that. That's fabulous. Well, and especially because, you know, these musicians that you're playing with, um, there was, I love the, another quote here, I can express myself in a way that frees me a lot of the emotional weight of the job. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, these kids are learning very early a skill that they're going to be able to use their entire lives as a way to, you know, for their mental, you know, health and their sense of well-being. I think that's really, really fabulous. What I love about, you know, the story of the twins and that you're really, you know, that giving these kids a tool that they'll be able to use for their emotional well-being their entire lives, that also makes me wonder, you know, there's a whole... Um, a modality that's grown up called music therapy. So what's the difference between, what is music therapy? What's the difference between that and handing a child an instrument? What, I, I'm not clear on that. Um, there's a lot of difference. Um, I think with handing a child an instrument, we're, we're starting to f uh, form the foundation. Um, I think most music therapists have, have, like me, started music as children. And so music just becomes another of your modes of communication, your ways of expression. Um, the music therapists are those who go professionally into using music then as a way of caring for patients. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a wonderful field. Um, they're trained in psychology and music theory and instruments, and they use their music to help um, the patients express themselves in a way sometimes where, where pain or grief or trauma has silenced their words, sometimes the music will help to bring that out. And uh, the music therapists are trained to use uh, music in such a way where they can professionally just very slowly bring that out of, of the patient. Which isn't to say that by the bedside a musician can't come and play for, um, play in a hospice or in a senior center, but it's, it's a, a little bit of a different approach because they're not trained to be using it therapeutically, they're just sharing their music. I see, yeah. Well, and, and it makes sense that would people would kind of automatically get how that would work because, I mean, we almost do that to ourselves in a way. I mean, mm -hmm. we use music to make ourselves feel things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like if we want to get pumped up to go out for the night, we turn up the music really loud. And if we want to soothe ourselves after a long day of work, we come home and put on the, you know, the soothing music. And so we're already kind of using it, I think, in our own lives yes. to it's make us feel things. It's something that's innate, and it's yeah. it's something that's gone on through the generations, um, and really universally. There's there are um, there's music all over the world, and everyone uses a different melody or a different kind of music for uh, for healing. In fact, um, at one point, the healer and the musician were the same person. Um, in many cultures, the shaman plays music, and that is for healing for the patient. And and as time went on, and his instruments became more specialized. Uh, music has separated from that, but um, there's no reason why we shouldn't be bringing it back together again. Yeah, and I think in some places they kind of are, aren't they? I mean, with the, Alzheimer, the work around Alzheimer's mm. and dementia patients, I know that just, um, you were talking about that in your book a little bit, and 
when my grandmother had Alzheimer's, you know, she hadn't been able to speak in a very long time, and we brought her to see an Elvis impersonator, and she stood up and she sang and she knew every single word to every mm -hmm. song. I mean, she was singing Hound Dog, like, you know, <laughs> she had, she was fine. And she came back to us, like, for just that yeah. brief moment, you know, and then just kind of, you know, was gone again. But it was amazing. It yeah. was absolutely amazing. And you, just, can you talk a little bit about that? Because you did, you know, you, you... Well, as we... One of the remarkable things about music is it engages so many parts of your brain. Um, there used to be this thing called the Mozart effect that, you know, Mozart, make, Mozart makes you smarter. And it's not that simple. And it can't be that simple because music is so complex. What it is is that music engages so much of your brain and that you're creating new neural connections everywhere and laying those down. And when you add emotion to it, it really tacks it down into your, into your brain. And so the songs that she learned when she was in, the tw in her 20s and 30s and you know, dancing in the, in the dance halls, those are going to be the songs that are going to pop right back out again when she hears them. And so every, everyone has a soundtrack. And um, I've seen that too. We've, we, we played in a, an Alzheimer's unit with a string quartet of, um, and all of us have parents who are also living with dementia. So it was that much more meaningful for we, the caregivers, who are playing our music as caregiving to another population with, with Alzheimer's. Mm. But when we started playing Broadway tunes, they all stood up and sang, and we found out later which ones had lost their ability to speak. But at that moment, you can't tell uh, which one um, does no longer generates new speech because all of them were belting it out. Oh, that's and, great. And, and they felt so free. You could just mm -hmm. see the tears of joy that they had for a moment, like your grandmother, mm -hmm. been just released from, from their, their word prison. Oh, so I love that. It's, I mean, it just gives me chills. And, and, and for you as a physician, too, and with parents, you know, who suffer from this, I mean, how does that impact you emotionally when you're there and playing for these people who just have such a reaction? Well, it's something that we don't, we don't learn in, you know, in medical school. And this is one of the things that really got me excited about leading the, the Longwood Symphony for, for the 20 years that I did. Um, the orchestra and playing in the orchestra was fine, but what was really, really impactful was taking these young medical students who were musicians, who were sort of at this cusp of, should I be a musician? Should I be a doctor? How do I balance my life? Taking them into clinics and then asking them to reflect, which you know uh, a lot about, you know, reflect and write some narrative or talk about it. What did you see? What did you learn from this musical experience that you can take back to the wards? And s some students would say things like, you know, I didn't know that that Mr. Smith took that long coming across a walkway with his walker, and now that I see that that takes that long, I won't I won't rush him when he's in my clinic because sometimes the students only see them in a very small clinical setting mm -hmm. and they don't think about mm -hmm. the, the the life that is um, that people lead when they're not in clinic and not in hospital oh wow well and I love that that illustrates you know the power of music to connect again you know and the power of music and narrative and creative expression to connect us as human beings to each other in places that we might not otherwise connect mm -hmm. and um, this is another quote from your book um, about Dr. Hanser, who was working at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And um, so, oh, this I just loved, there's a, a, yet another phrase here that gave me chills, so I had to read it. Um, Music therapy has the potential to invoke a new order of healthcare, one where patients enter the medical center not just to be passively treated and cured, but also to activate their own creative capacity to take control of their health. Wow. Can you talk about that? I mean, that's, that's a powerful statement. Well, Dr. Suzanne Hanser is a, a very special person. She is the chair of the music therapy department at Berkeley College of Music. She's got lots of hospital experience, and she's guiding all of these, this new generation of music therapists to really um, listen, to go to the bedside and meet the patient where they are, um, help them to get a hold of their, their lives and their pain by administering music, singing their own songs, choosing, remembering the songs of their lives that, that, uh, that, that, that touch them and keep them moving forward. Oh, I love it. What I love about music also is um, when you're trained in music or when you're listening to music, time has many, many points. Mm -hmm. you, you're listening to music at the moment of the first beat but there, and the next beat and the next beat, so you're moving forward that way. But you're also anticipating to the end of the, 
the symphony or the end of the sonata and you're also remembering what the contours are going to be and so you're really looking at time in a very flexible way which is also helpful for someone who's um, healing or who is in the hospital because at the moment they may be experiencing a moment of, of, of post-op pain or something but looking forward to when they're again healthy is yeah. a way to envision and to visualize beyond that moment of pain. So musically you can visualize as well. Yeah, oh, I love that. And I mean, because you're also, you can do it musically, and then when the songs have lyrics, you're also combining yep. it. So you're really, you're storytelling in multiple ways, mm -hmm. which I love. Oh, okay. So, well, this is just, I have chills all over the place. This is great. Um, and so one of the things that we love to do is, because this is, you know, we're a show that's called Healing Words. Mm -hmm. We really believe that, that writing and creative expression of multiple kinds can be a powerful healing tool. And I would love to have you offer the patients and caregivers who are watching uh, a writing prompt. Well, I think one of them is just right along these lines. Is there a piece of music that you think of that makes you laugh? Is there a piece of music that makes you cry? Or is there a piece of music that makes you feel wistful and write about that moment and feel how the music starts to circulate right in your ear mm. as you're thinking about that and as you're writing it down. And the next time you hear that music, it will be that much more powerful for you also because you'll have crystallized in words also what that meant. Oh, I love that. I'm gonna go home and try that one too. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and it's a perfect segue. So did you listen to music when you wrote your book? I always hear music. Yeah. So, um, and I always turn on music. So yes, I did. But, but music yeah. is um, sometimes when I'm feel, feeling discombobulated, I'll turn on Bach, and it will help me to center. Or um, and sometimes if I'm, I've got mixed emotions about something, I'll turn on sometimes a slow movement of Mahler Ooh. that will really sort of pull things out and. So it really depends. Yeah. Well, would you read a couple of excerpts from your book for us? Sure, I'd be delighted to. Oh, thank you. Saving a life and restoring a family. On a Saturday summer afternoon in 1989, a young man came to my office. He was the last patient of the day. He was of Korean descent, having been adopted as a young child by an American family in Norwell, Massachusetts. There were two Caucasian biological children, sisters and two adopted Korean children in the family. He had just graduated from Norwell High School and was eager to pursue his business degree at, a, at the prestigious Babson College in the fall. He was taking a summer tennis program at a local college, but came to me puzzled by the development of multiple bruises on his legs and arms. Did you fall from the court? I asked him. Did you hit yourself with a racket? He had not. I drew some lab tests and sent him home, only to call him back right away. The blood smear was abnormal. The diagnosis was leukemia. Rather than entering Babson College that fall, he entered Children's Hospital of Boston, where he spent the majority of his next two years. Over the past decades, the cure rate of childhood leukemia has stead steadily risen. Chemotherapy courses have been refined to reduce long-term toxicity. But still, there are some forms of the disease that are more virulent than others. Unfortunately, he had particul a particularly aggressive illness. He suffered two relapses, and it seemed that his cancer was becoming progressively more resistant to the chemotherapeutic agents that were offered. His oncologist determined that he would need a bone marrow transplant to survive. Like a fingerprint, everyone has a unique set of HLA markers in order to minimize the chance for rejection, doctors try to find a donor whose HLA sequence, human leukocyte antigen, that's the most similar to that of the patient. Sadly, at the time, in the 19, late 1980s, the National Bone Marrow Donor Registry had only 3,000 donors of Asian ancestry in their files, and none were a close match to be suitable. Ever resourceful and desperate to find a solution to save their son, the family reached out to the adoption agency that had first introduced them to him. They learned that his biological brother had been adopted by a family in Switzerland. Now 22 years old, this young man agreed to come to the United States 
to be tested and to see his younger brother again. Sadly, what must have been a happy reunion on many levels was bittersweet. His brother's bone marrow was not a close enough match. At the same time, his adoptive sisters, both in college, were organizing bone marrow drives on college campuses across the country. They needed money for travel and supplies. And that's when the Longwood Symphony agreed to dedicate its next concert to raising funds for the National Marrow Donor Program. In this case, while we did not raise a large amount of money, our concert brought together students from many of Boston's colleges and raised awareness in the community about the National Bone Marrow Registry. It garnered the gratitude of the nurses and doctors at Children's Hospital caring for so many leukemia patients who were waiting for the match. The concert enabled his sisters to organize five more bone marrow drives on college campuses across the country and spread the word to other students. Through our efforts and those of many others in the community, they raised the Asian bone marrow registry numbers from 3,000 to 11,000. While none of those 8,000 new donors turned out to be a match, I can't help but think of the hundreds of other patients over the years who did find a match from the bone marrow registry, not knowing that the registry had been expanded by the generous act of these young people 20 years ago. The wonderful epilogue to this story is that he eventually did find a match, his own biological mother in Korea. The adoption agency that had so lovingly found a a family for him 15 years before had kept such good records that they were able to locate her and unite her, and unite her with her dying son. A few months later, she gave him life for a second time. Through a successful bone marrow transplant, a deep and lasting relationship has developed now among the son who has been cured from his cancer, his biological Korean mother, and his adoptive American family. Now I'd like to urge you to try another exercise that taps into the power of your own creative expression. But don't worry, you don't have to be a creative type to do this, and you don't have to be a writer either. We all know how to tell stories. We've been doing it our entire lives, around the kitchen table, at the water cooler, and when we tuck our children into bed. So first, take a moment to think about the big moments in your life. It could be the day you had your first child, the day you got married, it could be when you found out you got the job you wanted. Then if you have access to a computer or mobile device in your room, please put on some music that reminds you of that moment. Then pull out something to write with. If you don't have any paper or a device you can write on, you can ask your nurse to contact the Dolores Jean Lavins Center for Humanities and Medicine and we'll bring you a notebook and pen. Once you've chosen your big moment and turned on the music, write about all the memories that come up about that day. You can use the writing prompt, I remember, and answer it a bunch of different times. I remember, I remember. Here's an example. I remember standing in my aunt's kitchen. I was in my 20s and was staying with my aunt and uncle to help take care of my grandmother. My grandmother kept saying Andy over and over again. And I realized, finally, that what she was doing was singing. Before my grandmother lost her language skills to Alzheimer's, she would sing the hymn called In the Garden. And then she would laugh because she thought the lyrics, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, were about a boy named Andy. Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. So now, every time I listen to that song, I think about my grandmother. I think about the day in the warm kitchen with the yellow wallpaper. I think about the eggplant lasagna I made that was sitting on the countertop. I think about my grandmother's white hair and her bright blue, blue eyes that squeezed together while she held her stomach, and she always held her stomach when she laughed. So now it's your turn. Turn up the tunes and see what your memories bubble up for you. And remember, creative expression is a powerful healing tool. You can use it to calm your nerves, tap into your inner wisdom, and track your healing journey. I hope you'll give it a try. Thank you so much for watching Healing Words, brought to you by the Dolores Jean Lavin Center for Humanities and Medicine at Mayo Clinic. I'm Jackie Fletcher. You can reach me with your thoughts or suggestions or arrange to have a writer visit you in your room by using the contact information on the screen. I'd like to send out a big, huge thank you to Dr. Wong for being here today. It was an absolute pleasure. Until next time, be well.